Most of the time, my family is telling me I'm talking too much. So when they offered me an opportunity to come and speak, I was like, why, yes, because I advertise foster care and adoption to just about anybody at the grocery store if they talk to me at all about why all of my children don't match each other. Um, so my name is Kristen Hunziker, and my husband and I um, have been fostering for not too many years, but we've had a pretty good number of kids who have come through our home. Some we've had as long-term placements, which is generally anything more than just a couple of weeks. And then we've also had emergency overnight where they're just in for a few hours and then they're gone the next morning. Also some weekends, some other sort of shorter term placements. Uh, so we currently have a 17 year old young lady and a 12 almost 13 year old young lady she's waiting for next month to happen and the birthday and then we have then the boys the ones that I have given birth to are 11 and 10 so it's always kind of fun to see the look of shock on people's faces when oh the kids are 10 11 12 and 17 <laughs> and they're like oh where did they all come from well <laughs> Here's where they came from. So we um, started actually fostering, I could say by accident, but we don't really think that anything is an accident. We had, since we were newlyweds, actually always wanted to adopt. And our primary the main thing that we wanted to do was to adopt teenagers, which anybody think that we're crazy because we wanted teenagers? Just out of the blue, any, you can raise your hands if you think that we were nuts. Well, guess what? We might be a little bit crazy, but that's okay. And so we had actually originally gone through all of the adoption training through DHS and realized at the end of that that we needed more housing space because we lived in a teeny tiny apartment in Beaverton. So we bought a house a few years later, moved to Hillsboro, had room, emailed DHS, okay, we're ready now. And I got in, but that was just to the general email line, got a message back, thank you for your interest in foster care. Guys, that was not what I signed up for. Uh oh, that's not why we were there. But my husband and I looked at each other and we said, well, maybe this is not an accident that our email went to the wrong department. So I went and met with them. When I told her that we wanted teenagers and we wanted to help where the help was needed, she started crying because nobody wants to take the teenagers, except for us crazy people. But we love teens. So we said, well, where do you need help? Foster or adopt? And she said, foster. And we said, we'll do it. So here we are. In the end, actually, um, our 17-year-old who has been with us since she was 15, we are actually adopting her. So we still, you know, things not so magically work out. Um, God is certainly in control of all of that. And so we are heading towards adoption with her. And uh, it has been really a great blessing in our life. And um, people laugh because we, 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 do, we are open to kids. Our, when you sign up for foster care, you can specify if you want specific ages, we said zero to 21 because we wanted to be able to take sibling groups if they wanted to stick together. Um, and so the most of our kids though have been older. So if anyone ever has any questions about what it's like to take in teenagers, there are certainly issues, but I can tell you that there are wonderful teenagers from loving Christian homes who also have issues because this whole we're human thing, I don't know. Um, and so it has been really a wonderful, 
wonderful blessing to our family, just the things that we have learned and um, it, people do laugh, but I, I really like it when the kids can like make their own sandwiches and wipe their own poop. It's really great. Um, and we have, we have so many, so much fun with them and it's a wonderful thing. So I appreciate being able to be here and to be able to share and answer all kinds of questions. My name is Rich Vile, and I'm the uh, state representative for House District 26. I live over in Shoals. Uh, was that a? Do you live in 26? <laughs> oh well, thank you very much. <laughs> um, we live over in Shoals, and House District 26 actually takes in Shoals, Sherwood, Wilsonville, and up into South Hillsboro, Cooper Mountain, Bull Mountain, that area. It's been a real uh, interesting experience for me to serve as a state representative this past few months, and I'll talk more about that in just a moment. But first, let me tell you a little bit about the experience that Paula and I have had as a family. Our, uh, I, I suspect, by the way, that I don't need to reinforce the idea that uh, every child is precious, and our opportunity to uh, interact with some that we did not give birth to has been a great blessing. Um, goes back about 35 years for us. I was in law school down at Willamette, and I was coaching a basketball team at my local church. And there was a little boy that started coming to play basketball every day. Uh, he went by the name of Nixon. Now, back then, that wasn't such a good name to have. <laughs> but... When I started quizzing him about it, little Vietnamese boy, little guy, four foot, about four foot ten at the time. Today, he's nearly 50 years old and he's only about five foot one, but, you know, he was very little at that point. And I said, Nixon, what the heck is Nixon all about? Well, um, nobody can pronounce my name. His name was Hua, Hua Pham. Nobody can pronounce my name, so... Um, I took Norm Nixon of the uh, San Diego Clippers as my name. <laughs> I explained to him, you know, there was a guy named Nixon that maybe isn't, I don't care, all my friends know Norm Nixon. So we took Nixon as his name, and I coached him in basketball for a couple of weeks until I started to notice that he would come to basketball Monday and Tuesday. Sometimes he would come on Wednesday, but he wasn't in very good shape, and he never came the rest of the week. And when I started to ask him about that, he said, well, I'm living with um, a bunch of guys from my village. Now, this was, this was not good English. He had not been here in the U.S. very long. Back, this was back in 1981. Um, I, I, I don't have any food after about Wednesday. We run out of food. We get an allotment of food on Monday and, uh, or Sunday night sometimes. And we're out of food by Wednesday, and so I'm just not quite strong enough. The only meal I get is uh, hopefully a meal at school sometimes. So Paula and I, at that point, were a young couple in law school with no money, three little children, uh, and one on the way. And um, we had never, ever thought about adoption or fostering. We were so busy trying to feed the ones we had that there was nothing we could even consider in that respect. Um, and yet, one night uh, after Sunday dinner, when we had Hua there at home, the, uh, um, just the spirit came to us. And we looked at each other at the same time and didn't even have to say anything and knew that we needed to, to bring Ho into our home. So we took him in the living room, just she and I, and uh, said, we were thinking about it. Well, we kind of lied to him. We said, we've been thinking about it. Well, we've been thinking about it for about 10 minutes at that point. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, 
Um, and we said, uh, we'd really like you to come stay with our family and be part of our family. And he broke into tears and uh, said that that was the thing that he'd been praying for for as long as he could remember. Well, that, that moment touched off a journey for us that has, uh, has been remarkable. <clears throat> I, didn't, I didn't get up here with a tissue at all, I apologize. So anybody's got one, I'll gladly, uh, <laughs> I'll gladly accept I, the offering. I have two packs. Well, here we go. Good, thank you very much. <laughs> We, uh, we soon realized that it was a whole lot more complicated than just saying, hey, why don't you come sleep at our house? Um, we got a hold of the uh, local uh, DHS. Uh, back then it was called Children's Services. We got a hold of those folks. They came in. They wanted to do a home study. Uh, we said, fine. What does that mean? Well, we got to make sure that you have the resources. You have the bed. You have the, this. You have that. Well, guess what? We didn't qualify in about six different ways. And fortunately, I had a good friend whose dad was a, a judge in Marion County where we were going to law school. And he said, well, let's go talk to my dad and see what dad can do. And this judge, after talking to us and, and hearing the story, cut through all the red tape, uh, signed a, a guardianship order, and we ended up with Ho, and we were able to get him on our insurance, et cetera, et cetera. Now came a dilemma because we really did feel very close to Ho and wanted to have him become a permanent part of the family. But with no parents, he, he didn't know if his parents were still alive. He had escaped from Vietnam at 11 years of age, uh, gotten on a boat, um, ended up with a boat that ran out of fuel in the middle of the China Sea, picked up by a Norwegian fishing vessel. He ended up in a, in a refugee camp in Hong Kong, um, was uh, working in a toy factory in Hong Kong when some guys from his village figured out how to get uh, a, a visa to come to the U.S. as a refugee, and he tagged along with them. By the time he came to our house, he was only 13, but he'd been through a lot, as you can imagine. Um, but he didn't know if his parents were alive. He, 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 his dad had been in a, in a uh, concentration camp when he left Vietnam in the late 70s. His mom uh, was at home, but there was no way for them to communicate back in, the, back in those days. This is uh, the very, very early days of uh, post-Vietnam War. So we just didn't know what to do. We wanted to adopt Ho, but there was just no way to do that. So we did something, and, and I'm going to advocate to folks that, that this is something you need to be very conscious and very careful of. We just said to him, and he to us, we're going to be family. And <clears throat> to this day, we are. His children are our grandchildren. Um, he calls me dad. Now, fortunately, in about 1993, I was able to figure out a way to go back to Vietnam with a, with a State Department delegation and found his mother and his father. Uh, his mother actually came to the U.S. in about 97 and spent about 10 years here before she went back to Vietnam when his father was uh, close to death. My wife and Ho's mother became best friends. He has two families. But this is, a, this is an individual that, even though we got him at 13 years old, uh, now 35 years later has become a, a very important part of the, of the Vile family. To try and shorten the story a little bit, about three years after Ho came into our home, we got a letter from Ton and T. Ton was a cousin from the same village area in Vietnam. He and T, uh, Ton was 14 and T was 10, and they had made it 
uh, out, of the, out of Vietnam. They'd been picked up uh, and landed in the Philippines. They were in a refugee camp called Palawan in the Philippines and um, had no paperwork. And they were under threat of being returned to Vietnam. And somehow he got a letter to me through a, through a Baptist missionary that had been in this refugee camp. And I began to go to work with the State Department at that point and try and, uh, and get Ton and T out. Worked for years on it. Just, just, uh, just did everything I could think of. Um, by that time, I was a lawyer. I, I tried to use uh, judges. I used my senator. I used uh, everybody I could think of, and it just wasn't happening. And then one day, I was driving along the road, and I got a really strong feeling. You should call the State Department. Try one more time. I'd given up. Um, well, maybe I hadn't given up, but I, I didn't know what else to do. I, I had no other alternatives. So that was a Sunday afternoon, and I told Paul about it as soon as I got home. Monday morning. Okay. Monday. All righty. Monday morning, I called the State Department, and guess what? The Philippines was in the middle of a war, and they said, if you'll go tomorrow, you can pick up these kids and bring them home. So, once again, uh, it was an experience that came about as a result, I believe, of an impression that came from God, and it, it was a blessing for us. Uh, after that, uh, three of their cousins on another side ended up in Thailand, and we brought them over. In the meantime, we've fostered many babies and, and others. Today, we have um, six birth children and seven that we call adopted. Some are adopted, some are in the, in the case of Ho, that have become permanent parts of our family. And I'm pleased to say we've got 42.6 grandchildren today. <laughs> in, in conclusion to this little um, uh, preamble, I just want to say this. I married a saint. Um, I don't know how that happened necessarily, but uh, it is important, I think, not to underestimate the amount of work that goes in to taking on children, whether they're a birth child or a foster child or an adopted child. Um, and I am so grateful that uh, I had the companionship and the partnership that we had that made it possible for us to do this successfully. I appreciate being here and I, I look forward to our conversation. Thank you, Representative Vile. Okay, we have a couple questions because I tried to guess what you might want to know from them. So, Christina, can you please um, talk a little bit about the foster, like the process to become a foster parent? Sure. I will, and um, also because that's, that's okay. I had to even fix my name tag, so but it's all right. <laughs> it's a lifetime problem. <laughs> um, and I will actually because Brooke is not with us, but um, my oldest and I actually have um, worked with Embrace Oregon on some of the, the foster parent recruitment panels because who else to advocate for foster parents for teens than a teen who is in foster care who says, hi, people, you can do this. Um, so I would, I would say um, Embrace Oregon now in their partnership with DHS, which is now statewide, has foster care certifiers in each office. And so for kind of a I don't want to say fast track because it's government cogs moving relatively slowly, but for a relative fast track towards certification for foster care and or adoption, uh, you can contact Embrace Oregon and they connect you with one of their certifiers. Otherwise, you contact 
DHS yourself if you want to work with DHS. There's also private foster um, agencies that work all around the state. Uh, generally, that's called therapeutic foster care, so it can be a little bit different than what happens with the DHS. But you, you contact DHS, you attend, I've lost track of how many hours were, I think it's 24 hours worth of what they call foundations training. And then you have a home study, which involves your certifier asking you every single question about every single part of your life that you never thought you would tell a total stranger about. And then they write their long papers and fill out their stacks and stacks of paperwork and goes to their supervisor. And if everything is approved, and then you're approved as a foster family. And uh, currently, Oregon is not a foster to adopt state. So when you take those classes, you pick a path of adoption or foster care certification. There is a, a huge need for foster care families right now. Uh, I know that we're Washington County. Um, even last month, they were out of placements for even for babies, which most that tends to seems to be the more popular um, age there to take are the babies. Um, but Washington County was full. We were getting weekend calls even from Multnomah County looking for homes. And so, so emergency they're for emergency placements and um, there's different, I guess, classifications. Do you want to say what those are really fast? Yes. So there's uh, shelter care, which takes care if, if there's a, a home where the kid can move, but maybe they need two weeks to get ready. So they need a, a place for this young person to go live for two weeks. That's shelter care. Emergency are after hours or weekends when uh, we, the, uh, a kid could be picked up off the street or, anyway, offices are closed. Parent, and so parents the, put in jail. Parents we put get, in jail. We get kids when parents get put in jail. Um, and then, and so that's the emergency. Placements, and then there's also respite care where you can also just side note it's kind of respite care can be potentially kind of a dip in the water with a big toe because you can be certified for respite care and not be a foster family who's available for long term placements. So if you want to practice. Something I don't I don't I don't know what else you would call that, but it's kind of practice. But the respite care is essentially taking care of a foster a kid who's already in foster care, while the foster family that they're with goes to do something else, whether it's take a trip or mostly it's take a trip. Sometimes they just need a break because it can be hard having kids which I think anybody who has kids knows. It's a possibility for it to be hard sometimes. Um, so is that kind of yeah. the... Yeah, and then there's the, is it long-term care? Oh, and then the long-term placements where it is expected that the young person will remain with your family until either they are reunified with their biological parent or the case is moved to, uh, their case plan is moved either to adoption or guardianship. Very difficult, got it. Um, I won't say that it's very difficult. Okay. It does partially depend upon the age of the child, age 14 or older, they are given immeasurably more choices as to what happens with their life, which is, seems kind of crazy to say you're 14, you can decide, but please, Think about all of the decisions that have been made about that child's life that they had zero control over. And so when they, it, it does, it changes them to realize that they have control over 
something and they can make a decision. So 14 or older, they can make a decision if they want to return to their biological parent or not. For us, because we're already a certified foster family, she was 15 when she came to us. It was her decision. She asked us to adopt her. It wasn't us saying, please let us adopt you. She said, I don't want to go back. This is where I belong. And so we're now, we just had our foster care recertification, which happens every two years. Um, but, and then that was in February. And then last week we had our adoption certification home study. So they were hoping that those dates could line up a little bit more because the certifier would have been able to do foster and adoption at the same time. So it's easier when they're older. I, does that help at all? Otherwise, the wild, the, the wild card is parents, the birth parents, if they're under 14. If they're under 14, you just cannot predict what's going to happen with respect to birth parents. And the legal implications can be really, really complicated. But, but there's nothing wrong with being, we're, we're both certified foster, and we have had certification for adoption as well while we were certified foster. So it's not impossible. I, I actually think that it's pretty good where we are because there are uh, loopholes-ish. Um, the, what I, something that I have seen, I have friends who foster in foster to adopt states and sometimes they have had kids who fit perfectly with their family and that they wanted to adopt taken away from them because some other family was deemed more acceptable for those children and that portion can be hard. One thing here is, um, so we are our 12 year old placement who currently now um, is up for guardianship but she would not be a fit for our family for forever. We love her and we care for her and we want to help her as best we can, but as far as a long-term placement goes, she wouldn't fit. And so with, with it not being fostered to adopt, that gives us no um, leash. leash, really. Yeah, as Liberty said, to... We don't have, yeah, <laughs> but it's it's true. We there's not there's not this um, obligation to adopt her. What we're going to do is take care of her as best we can, and give another family tons of information that can be useful about her and who she is as a person. Um, yeah, infant fostering is, is completely different, of course, than teenage experiences. And uh, it can be particularly difficult when they're very, very short term. Uh, you get attached to those little children and, and it can be uh, remarkably tough. But I will tell you this, we have had amazing experiences with infant fostering where we had them for a month, uh, three or four months. Uh, I can remember one, one little boy, six months, goes back a number of years ago. He's now a junior in high school. And we know his dad. Uh, this one actually happened because his dad worked for a company that one of my son owned. And his mother was arrested on an airplane. And the dad was nowhere to be found at the time. He was actually in Alaska. And uh, they knew that we had some attachment to the dad, so they called us, and we ended up taking that little boy for, for a period of time. I love seeing that kid today. Uh, he is just a whole lot of fun for us. But I'm also really glad that we were not in a, in a uh, foster to adopt state where that might have been pushed even harder on us at the time. It would not have been the right thing for, for that guy's um, for that family to have that happen. Uh, oh, staying, um, 
certified for little children is a little more challenging because as your family changes and grows, thing, things can really affect your certification for, for infants. The question is, is there any prohibition about sharing your faith with foster children? Wait just a second. There we go. Um, yeah, th there is, and and it's a um, it's not a super strict concept, but let me give you our, our experience with that. I I was a Mormon bishop for a number of years, and at one point while I was bishop, we had a foster child come, and. She wanted to go to a Catholic church on the other side of town. We live in Shoals. She wanted to go to a Catholic church clear out here on East Sandy Boulevard. Um, I was happy to bring her out, and I did. I brought her out. In fact, I brought her out before my bishopric meetings in the morning on Sunday mornings and then drove back and then came back and got her and, and drove back. Even the fact that I was continuing to go to my church after dropping her off was brought up by the caseworker that we were dealing with as negatively influencing that child. And we had to work through that. She ended up being one that stayed with us for a lot of years and we're still very, very close to her and her family. But at least in our experience, and maybe I don't know, maybe it's the Mormon thing. I, don't, I really don't know. But we get cautioned frequently by caseworkers to be very careful in terms of not proselyting to our foster children. What kind of experience have you had? Well, I, th I think I'm going to stand up because I'm short. Sorry, guys. Um, I, I've actually had people ask sort of a similar question because we have older kids and um, you know if you've got babies or toddlers they just go with you everywhere you go so you're you're taking them to church or yeah. whatever but um, with older kids we can't force them to attend church with us and our our foster care certifier and that's one of the questions that they ask you when they're doing their home study talking to you about those sorts of things and um, so we have had some kids who <laughs> were not able to be left at home alone but they they didn't want to attend the church service with us so they would go with us to church and they would simply sit out in the lobby and eventually actually they would come in and sit with us um, and now we've got the girls don't attend church with us and that's by their choice we're not allowed to force them but it does if you are a person who is living your life with a faith-based focus it does certainly um, I think encourage you not to simply give lip service to the faith that you're representing because they're not going to church with you and so you're living your life as you think it should be lived in kindness and love <laughs> towards other people. Perfect. Okay. Does DHS affiliate themselves with Planned Parenthood? The answer is technically no, but certainly there are numerous occasions where a DHS caseworker will help a pregnant teen get um, reproductive they, what they call reproductive services through Planned Parenthood. No, if I, I've seen that happen as well. I, we've had, for a while, we had a run of pregnant uh, teenage girls in our home during a period when we didn't have any other teenagers. Uh, that's, that's one of the things, by the way, that you need to be aware of is 
the complication of having more than one teenager, particularly of opposite sex, in a home at the same time could be something they really paid close attention to, and I think they should. But we had a run of, of pregnant girls through the home uh, back about 10 years ago, and um, there were DHS caseworkers that would help them to get um, uh, adoption care kind of services, etc. So it wasn't always just push them into an abortion, but that did happen too. There is a program that I would strongly recommend everyone try, even if they're thinking about getting into uh, fostering or adoption, and it's called the CASA program. It's a program that uh, allows you to volunteer to be essentially the advocate for a foster child. And uh, CASA is a phenomenal program. It's, uh, we actually fund it as a state, and it allows you to become sort of the big brother or big sister to a foster child and help them with their transitions. It can be, it, it is one of the most important and one of the most phenomenal programs I've seen. Many of the CASAs that we've met by fostering kids have become our good friends because they, they really helped us with, uh, with respect to a transition, particularly those that we had relatively short term. Do you have an unhelpful thing? An unhelpful thing, yeah. Don't try to own any human being. You get, a, you get a foster child or you get an adoptive child, I don't care what is the nature of them coming into your home or at what age, do not try to, we don't own each other as human beings just because we're parents. Um, and I, this, for me, this is a very, very important thing. We all, we all arrived here as individuals. We all came with, with a set of, of um, uh, individuality, and we need to recognize that. And one of the things we really simply can't do successfully is demand that someone love us back. Uh, it just doesn't work that way. Helpful and unhelpful. Hmm. Um, now, these are for people that are not able to foster adopt. Do you know of ways they can get involved or that can help foster parents? So helpful, um, especially if, like, we live out in Hillsborough, there's the foster closet, which hands, it, it's basically like a store, but all kids in foster care can go and take whatever they want for free. And so, one, I encourage you, instead of donating your used clothing to even furniture, beds, and stuff, uh, I suggest don't donate that to the Goodwill, but instead donate it to the foster closet because it, they have the storefront for clothing and they have a warehouse for furniture items. And it'll there's a bulletin board in there and it'll say up on there, so-and-so looking for a dresser or a changing table. And so that's one way they need people to work in the in the foster closet, it would be. It's only open on Thursdays, and then the first and third Saturdays of the month. It would be great. I know they. It's Amy and Amy who run it. They spell it different ways, but they would love to have more people volunteering, both in in the store and sort. You know, hanging up clothes, sorting and sorting stuff out. Um, it is available for all foster families in Washington, Multnomah, and Clackamas counties. So it's a bit of a drive. I My girls luck out because we literally live down the street, and when they, they can go shopping every single week, shopping, it's great. But, I mean, as far as clearing out stuff, too, from your own homes, it's springtime, anybody love to purge, it's so great. Give that stuff people will be able to use it. Um, that's an organization. Otherwise, if you know foster families, there are always, I mean, take for example, you know a foster family that has four toddlers. Maybe you could offer to buy them shoes or something. Maybe if you have a lot of extra pocket change running around, you could offer to like pay for braces, orthodontic care for, you know, things that are not available from the state. Um, not so helpful things is don't look at me kind of all side goggling when I tell you my kids are 
10, 11, 12. We had one week where the kids were 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, 13, 15. You should have seen the looks I got that week. And a 15-month-old baby. Um, if your kids are young, you can use WIC. And then if you have older kids, uh, I've certainly gotten my fair share of kind of um, glares at having teenagers with homemade tattoos and piercings out the wazoo. I didn't, I didn't give those to them. I mean, I don't know what you want me to, but I'm going to love them no matter what they look like and so that sort of and you know especially in the church don't be surprised if like I've got a teenager and an expletive flies out every once in a while because guess what guys nobody's been monitoring their language because they probably haven't had a parent at home to watch out for them so okay um Aubrey-Ann, do what's the name of the organization aubrey -Ann? Okay, so Aubrey Ann wants to make sure that you guys know, especially if they're younger, probably, right? Yeah. So you can be a counselor with Royal Family Kids Camp, which they have them all over the state. Royal Family Kids, Kids, Kids Camp. camp. Be a for kids. The and then the other one, we're going to get to your question, promise. The other one that I want um, you guys to know about is Together We Rise. They have a fantastic um, social media, but one of the big things that they do, um, I don't know how much experience. Kirsten and Representative Vile have had, but a lot of kids in the foster care system, when they're removed from a home, they are given a garbage bag to put their few belongings in, and then they travel with a garbage bag to their to and from different foster care. And obviously, what do we put in garbage bags? We put trash in garbage bags. So what Together We Rise does is their goal is to give a duffel bag to every child in the foster system. So they do duffel parties where just like a church group or family, there's lots of kids that do these for their birthday parties. Instead of bringing me um, toys, we're going to you know bring a donation to pay for They have basically one blue duffel that they do for all the foster care and then you decorate them with messages and the in the duffel goes like a stuffed animal for younger <laughs> kids. They also raise money for bikes because for older kids that are in the foster system, um, they don't have any way to get around for transportation. So Together We Rise is aiming to give bikes and also scholarships for kids that graduate high school in the foster system, scholarships for them to go to college. And then again, just to remind you, Kristen mentioned Embrace Oregon. They also um, have a need for office parents, which is if you have some retired, if you're retired or just have some free time, that um, a lot of kids in the foster system, especially in Oregon where we have such a shortage of foster families, children are spending all day in offices of caseworkers. And so Embrace Oregon would love more volunteers to go, and I'm sure that there's background checks and stuff. Do you know anything about that, Kristen? Yeah, there are, yeah, so there are, there are background checks and for the parents, but um, it may seem like it doesn't take up, um, like it's not, it's not a hard thing to do, and it may seem like not a very important job to go sit in an office with kids, but remember that if the caseworker is watching the kids, that's that much work that the caseworker isn't actually getting done. And all of the caseworkers that I know are ridiculously overworked at this point in time underpaid. and underpaid, which is sad because they're trying to help keep these kids going. Okay, so we had your question that I promised. Absolutely. A, that self-awareness tells me that you're exactly the right person to do this. Um, and B, um, I don't care. We, I remember the days with two kids. Um, three, you're outnumbered, and so you might as well keep going after that. Uh, <laughs> The, the reality is, honestly, now that I'm in my 60s and looking back over those days when we were struggling with exactly the same questions, I'm so glad we took the ones we did. And um, just uh, earlier today, I was having lunch down the road here with, uh, with one of our sons and his three kids. And telling stories about dad 
to the grandkids now. The joy that comes from that sort of thing, because it wasn't perfect. In fact, I don't want to be really sobering here, but we actually had one of the foster children sexually abuse one of our birth children when she was a little girl. And that was a very, very, very difficult thing to get through. Today, that foster child is still our friend, and he and that little sister of his that he abused have reconciled and become friends. So I don't want to make it sound like it's always fun and it's always easy, but if you get through it years later, there's just nothing like it.